uh, I understand the pressure she is undergoing right now because after such authorities of the law, she is sharing the same so far. And even I'm not, uh, you know, qualified to sit here. <laughs> I should say. Uh, so, uh, Miss Anand. Uh, all this time, you have been asking me questions in my constitutional law class. Uh, I guess it's time to return the favor, right? I will be asking you questions. <laughs> well, so how, how do you feel being here, representing the views of your peers? Thank you, Ms. Damish. Uh, I feel extremely grateful for the opportunity to represent my alma mater here on this occasion. Uh, it is a privilege to have the support of my friends, my peers, teachers such as yourselves, the faculty members, and I am honored to voice the concerns of my peers as a law student uh, in this forum alongside such a decorated esteemed panel with judges and lawyers as well. All right, so let's start uh, with the first deliberation that we had uh, in the very beginning, which was about investing in women. It was quite a quality panel discussion. So I would like to uh, have a perspective that what this, this generation thinks about uh, what's the notion of investing in women after you received the deliberations from esteemed panelists? What's your perspective? Yeah, so uh, we believe that investing in women goes beyond financial considerations. It is more about the personal aspects of a woman and supporting them in what they have done, what they are doing and what they can do in the future. Uh, we believe it means deliberately allocating resources and creating opportunities for women for their well-being, empowerment, and uh, progress of women in the legal field, uh, which ensures that the woman has the chance to achieve the same things that a man can achieve without the extra effort that we need to put in. Yeah, because the word invest confuses us. Like, obviously, I'm talking money, so no, we are, we are talking about, uh, obviously, that what a woman stands for. And I really uh, agree that uh, this is the high time that we should shift to that notion. So, well, um, I see a lot of pages here with you. Uh, it's some extensive research you guys have done. So, uh, I hope uh, it will represent the perspective of the students. Yeah, so me and my friends, we have spent a lot of time on these uh, points and just have this with me so that we will not miss anything. Oh, that, that is great. You're, you're acting like a lawyer. <laughs> you don't want to miss anything. All right. So let's start with the statements uh, submitted by uh, your fellow students. Uh, so these are different statements, like seven to eight statements, uh, which uh, are quite well drafted and some are like uh, Instagram post. <laughs> so anyway, but uh, we'll be entertaining those statements and let's see what perspective they want to present regarding uh, the challenges they face. So here comes the first statement and this statement is submitted by one LLB student uh, and I quote, as a law student, I often hear opinions of people calling it a bad profession to be in. Try to put it, try to put it from perspective of a woman it gets worse. And the legal profession is discouraged following the notion that uh, it says we are liars, not the lawyers. <laughs> so what this notion is about? Yeah, so this is about the preconceived characters uh, about being a lawyer, especially women. Some lawyers and even law students have to deal with unwanted assumptions and criticisms about their characters. Uh, for instance, criminal defense lawyers, they are often judged for defending their clients based on certain crimes. Uh, in society, uh, they don't appreciate a female lawyer representing a criminal for certain offenses that people even shy of to mention. So, but uh, like, well, I have met many, uh, you know, criminal defense lawyers and those who are like good ladies established and they're doing quite well. Uh, do, do, we can see some here as well, if uh, I'm not wrong. Uh, so, it, it does not go uh, well. Yeah, so, uh, that's the thing. We as students who are just entering into the field, we do not have a lot of exposure to this. So, uh, events like this, it brings us some exposure that, yeah, there are people who are doing this which we did not know about before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So these type of forums are highly appreciated so that our students can actually know that, yes, we have the ball in our court. People do got those jobs in high positions. Indeed, uh, now, now, now I get it. So, well, can, can you reflect a, like, shortly about the solution to this problem? Yeah, so uh, we think the solution for this is through more talks, uh, sensors, sorry sensitization of the certain topics that the society shy away from talking, awareness and education on legal ethics, and street law campaigns. Uh, in our college's law society, we have a street law club where 
we work on promoting uh, the information and uh, spreading the information to the general public and youth about this topic so that people are more aware of this. We believe that the more we talk about this, uh, the more the general public will believe that these are things that can be changed. Indeed. So it's like something that we need to shift the perspective of uh, spreading the awareness about right to vote and we should shift it to uh, right to equality, right? And the proper representation. Indeed, uh, uh, well, uh, I register this comment and we will work on it. Now it's time for a second statement, which is from our Bachelor of Sharia and Law student. And it's a very uh, short statement, but I would like you to deliberate upon the same uh, because you're representing them. So the statement goes like, practical learning and experiential learning aspects should be focused upon while accommodating internship opportunities for the aspiring lawyers. So I guess this needs more uh, explanation. So what is it about? Yeah, so um, as aspiring lawyers, uh, we believe that there is an urgent need to prioritize practical and experiential opportunities in the legal education system. Uh, this is because while practical learning platforms such as MOOC course or workshops exist, they are often, of, they are often overlooked and inadequately showcased. And uh, another issue is that many of us face barriers such as work commitments and financial constraints. So especially working students which hinder our participation in these valuable experiences. I myself am one of students who are working and studying at the same time. So even though I would like to more participate in this, uh, I am unable to do so. So um, even so, despite these obstacles, uh, there are some of us that are driven by peer, uh, sorry, peer pressure to engage, uh, which really highlights the importance for broader awareness of these programs and experiential learning platforms for us. Uh, more to this, we often see male representation within the conduct of these practices and we believe that there is the need for more women representation in these learning experiences as it makes it more inclusive. So I think that we believe it's imperative that academia and the legal community bridge this gap to ensure that all students have access to learning experiences, especially in these litigation-based approaches. Okay, but I'm able to register one thing, but I'm not able to agree with the other one. Uh, uh, well, 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 let me see why. Because the first thing I agree, like when you're saying that, uh, uh, you know, there's, there are two things. Like, I, I really, we face that challenge a lot. When students say, oh, we have our job. We cannot attend the class. We cannot attend to this workshop. So some students, uh, we understand when there's a financial requirement, they, they have to submit to the job. But there's also kind of peer pressure running around in Maldives that if you're above 18, you should have your own pocket filled with the money that you earn. So that notion actually has to be, you know, eradicated. And I, indeed, I agree that it is high time that we should start prioritizing, right, the academics over the job that we are, you know, into. And because obviously, if, if we if we have three more years of serious study, it's going to land us far away uh, in comparison to when we start earning when we are eighteen. So that is something that we need to uh, indeed uh, look into, think, ponder upon. But the second thing where you said that, uh, as for my data, because uh, this is not going quite well, that you're saying in experiential learning activities, uh, there are more boys and less girls. But I really don't agree with this. Because I can, I can tell you personally, I deal with events. So I can tell you, give you two examples. This international mode, I'm talking about past two teams. The last team was of six students, two were coaches, four was to uh, four were our students. Out of six, only one was a boy. And they had four tours, Egypt, Abu Dhabi, uh, and uh, uh, Hong Kong. And they represented quite well, and actually they made the history. First time in Maldives, the students, they went for quarterfinals. So that was a big achievement for us. They, they hosted the flag there. And uh, in the so that was uh, one data that I, I have. And secondly, this team, current Wismuth team, it comprises of six students, all of them are girls. Mm -hmm. And this again the first time that they have reached the quarterfinals and in seven days they'll be starting their Hong Kong rounds and let's pray for them that they this time they give us the shield inshallah. Inshallah, all right. So uh, anyway, so that's my point uh, for you. So what's your opinion about it? Um. I think that 
in comparison to before, uh, the experiences for girls engaging in this is a little bit better. But I'm saying that it could be even uh, more better than it All is right, right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Indeed, I register that. All right, so let's uh, this time for the third statement, and uh, it is actually uh, from a LLM student, and uh, it's a personally it's a valid statement, and uh, I was quite shocked about it when I received this. It is promoting access to an inclusive legal community. Promoting access to an inclusive legal community, and uh, the student says that students getting a law degree from abroad has an advantage over the students getting a law degree in the Maldives. And this notion is a fallacy and it should be condemned. Uh, so do we have such kind of setup like really going on? Yeah, so this is something that we have noticed that it does exist. But we believe that studying abroad does not provide much knowledge about the practical intricacies of the Maldivian legal system, uh, the procedures or how things work in actual real courts and public offices. Uh, so this myth has to be brushed off that a degree abroad, especially in law, uh, is better than the regional programs if you're, pre if you're planning to practice uh, law in the Maldives. Uh, getting a degree from abroad could be fit for corporate law to some extent, but uh, regional programs sh could be coupled with internships and should be promoted. So for a solution for this, we would believe that promoting access to an inclusive legal community should prioritize equal opportunities for all aspiring lawyers regardless of where they are getting their education from. Uh, discriminating against students based on the location of their education, it goes against the principles of inclusivity and fairness in the legal profession. Indeed, so that is something for us to ponder upon. Like if these are the employers who are having this notion and letting it, letting it thrive, so that is a risk, right? Like if the employers are thinking that, oh, I would, I would give priority to the student because he got his degree from some somewhere in UK or somewhere, so he must be far better than the student who is getting a degree from here. So I, I, I think it needs some more deliberations and it's a valid point to register indeed uh, for the honorable panel and uh, the audience itself. All right, so moving to the fourth statement, again, is from a VSL student, and uh, the deliberation is, women may face barriers to access mentorship and networking opportunities, particularly in male-dominated practice areas or firms, and indeed, the glass ceiling does exist. So what does it entail? Yeah, so on the point of networking and professional development, uh, we believe that building professional connections and gaining practical experiences through internships and networking are crucial for us law students. Uh, however, some students, especially female students, we find it uh, we find networking a little bit intimidating or struggle to find opportunities as such. So finding mentors is crucial for us in our career advancement in the legal profession. Uh, women may face barriers to access mentorship and networking opportunities, particularly in male-dominated practice areas or firms. So for a solution for this, we would like it if it was easier for women to be more involved and see more women representation at events and positions that are usually male-dominated. Uh, we believe that this will make it more accessible and make it more comfortable for the female students to engage in these uh, events and such as well. So do you find it intimidating to actually talk with our esteemed panel? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> really? <laughs> so well, we have to bridge the gap. You can say assalamu alaikum, I am Anand. That's all right. <laughs> anyway, so let's let's move to the next statement. Uh, it says again, it's from an LLB student. Yeah, we have covered this. Yeah, LLB student. The statement goes like. Although more women are entering the legal profession, although uh, they are still underrepresented in leadership positions at law firms, corporations, and within the judiciary. Uh, it's time to showcase the women in law as role models. So what does it entail? What's the intent behind this? Role models? Yeah, so uh, we do believe that there is an underrepresentation in leadership roles for women. 
uh, glass ceilings and implicit biases can hinder women's advancement to partnership, executive roles, or judicial appoint appointments as we can see today. Uh, because of this, there are limited role models for students and the underrepresentation of women in leadership roles within the industry, which may lead to lack of visible role models for female students. And so we believe that it becomes hard for them to envision themselves succeeding in career opportunities, uh, and therefore they don't aim as high as they could achieve as they believe that these positions are meant for the male. I really wonder what else you need. So just have a look. Have a look. Come on. Yeah. Don't you have enough role models to follow? That's the point. I, I, I follow them. <laughs> yeah, uh, we should have more showcasing events like this, not only at Villa College but everywhere, not only on Women's Day but as often as it could be because uh, this events like this showcase that there are women in the industry and mm. actually seeing so many women in law here today it really boosts my confidence in uh, believing that I also can succeed in this career. I got the goosebumps, so I will clap for this one, really. <laughs> that, that's a valid point, indeed. Uh, yes, uh, so I agree. Sorry, <laughs> I take it back. <laughs> uh, so the seventh statement uh, is again from one Bachelor of Sharia Law student, uh, and it's quite important. And really, this is my point as well. I agree with this thing, and I really call for support. <laughs> So this statement is about promoting quality research. And it says, following the limited availability of Maldivian legal resources, like books, legislations, and case laws, when English is the medium of instruction, uh, which is a good practice, the students acknowledges that, which is a good practice, as most countries take their legal inspirations from the common law, we face a real challenge to deliver quality research that can be recognized internationally, not limited only to Maldives. And this limits the legal literature to the way and, and uh, put a cap on research collaborations with law societies and research centers overseas. Uh, it sounds like you have discussed this before as well, so is it you? Yes, this actually, is your point. I have been one of the students who have been yeah. relentlessly inquiring to you about this, even yeah. about my science. Uh, so this is an issue that we face of the limited resources and access to legal materials. Uh, we have to get information for a case, mostly from news sources, which we all know they are not really 100% reliable. So it would be much easier to engage in uh, independent research if we have Maldivian legal journals, databases, case commentaries and other documents available in, in English for the Maldivian legal issues to strengthen the future-oriented research reflecting an inclusive society. Uh, I personally dealt with this just three days ago while finishing up one of my assignments. There are very few, if any, legal resources that I could use to write a quality research article. Um, I would like to point out that we do have access to legal databases that provide a variety of legal literature, but when it comes to Maldivian legal research, it's kind of blank. Uh, our seniors and role models need to start writing and creating Maldivian legal uh, literature for us aspiring lawyers. Um, on this point, I would also like to point out that in the Maldivian legal literature that is available to us right now, we mostly see former Attorney General Husno al Sood's work mostly. Uh, we thank him for his dedication and hard work with the informative articles and books he has provided us with. But what we see less is the legal literature by women within the industry. We believe a new, uh, a new perspective of the industry from a woman can be a, an interesting outlook for the field and we would love to see more of that. Indeed, that, that's a very point and uh, now this, this time Ms. Anand is encouraging the <coughs> esteemed panel here that we have to start writing uh, in the A, but I write, at least in news articles, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, well, I missed one statement and I'm really sorry for that, that's the last statement. Um, uh, it was statement number 11, I'll just take it, uh, even though Maldives is now becoming more open, let me take this. 
real lawyer on their case. I guess not. Oh, okay. Yeah. So one statement, last statement, it's there from LLB student. And uh, he says or she says the gender is not mentioned here. That's why we kept it like that. Uh, even though Maldives is now becoming more open to the idea of women in serious professions, the society, and it's true, the society still asks for real lawyer. They ask for real lawyer on their case. The image of real lawyer has been fabricated deeply with men. Uh, it was also a question raised uh, from one of the students, which was uh, entertained by a uh, man, right? Yeah. So uh, what's your perspective about yeah, this? Yeah, so for this point, we have realized that despite the fact that women lawyers have good trial experience and ability to work in the legal field, this is a question that is still being asked, where is the real lawyer? So because people more uh, prefer the men than the women lawyers, right? So due to the gender bias, most aspiring female lawyers are usually intimidated by the environment of the legal landscape. Uh, we say this because we had questioned some of our uh, lawyer friends, women's working moms, and we got this from them. Uh, so I think that that overall affects their confidence and opportunities for participation because they shy away or believe their abilities are below the men in terms of their capability to perform in the industry, even within the classrooms. So for a solution for this, we would like if the involvement and hiring of female legal professionals are uh, increased in the work. So. Uh, give them opportunities based on their capabilities and we believe that through this more female lawyers are involved slowly fading the narrative of men being the most capable uh, lawyers out of the two genders okay that's good i, I feel like you know my career is over now <laughs> right uh, anyway so uh, these were the statements and uh, if we can have any feedback any suggestion and any policy that can actually entertain these thoughts if we can have it from uh, the flow, it will be really great. Can I discuss the item? Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. I am uh, two of the students I have seen uh, speaking about uh, women lawyers not being real lawyers. Um, the other day on TV, I saw uh, the attorney general send a lawyer to advocate his case in the law, uh, in uh, uh, the Supreme Court. And I think I saw a lady lawyer there. In a very high profile uh, political uh, case, I have seen uh, the, from the Prosecutor General's office uh, a lady lawyer uh, being uh, there and advocating for the uh, prosecution as uh, the Chief Counsel, if I'm not mistaken. She was here this morning. I'm not sure. What's her name? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, there. So, in. Uh, and we've seen his son in very high profile cases. She was the lead counsel in that. These are very, uh, I mean, uh, high profile cases in the sense every day it's being spoken in the media. So how come people uh, still think that, I mean, I'm a little bit out of touch with the uh, legal profession in that sense, but whenever I see a high profile, I'm sure there are many lawyers in the Attorney General's office also, but I saw a lady there in Prosecutor General's office also. There should be uh, many male lawyers as well, but a lady was there. Oh, are we, uh, and uh, again, uh, with other high profile cases, we see ladies there. So, are we just thinking of it, or it's been repeated, or uh, 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 whatever is being said when we do, aren't we? Uh, our brains not adjusting to what we see on TV and publicity. Is that what is happening? Because for me, I do not see the public. I engage with a lot of the public. I visit them in their houses. I speak, and I don't see this bias with the legal profession as such. So I'm just wondering how come uh, you know you're saying we see 
uh, the uh, lady justices performing in court, we see a lot of blame for some of the lady justices as well in political cases. And it's not the way they are talking about. So how come the younger students feel that the real lawyers are male? This is something I think you have to put your mind to. Because sometimes this uh, 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 sort of prejudice, you know, self-prejudice that we have stops us mm -hmm. from going forward. Uh, we, we should be proud that these high-profile cases are being uh, led by a women council. We should start talking about it. And if anyone says, you know, that the real lawyer is somebody else, please question them. Ask them, why are they saying this? Isn't this the case? You know, it's, it, it is not good to accept something like that, saying, okay, this is how it is. When I studied and came back, uh, I was offered a uh, partnership in Premier Chambers, myself, Shahin, and uh, Ustaz Nasheed. So, uh, I don't see, it is my, my decision to go away and be in politics, but they never pressured me or anything, and they took me on an equal footing. In fact, me and Shahin Hamid were called to the English power on the same day. He is a member of the Lincoln Center, I'm crazy. So, uh, uh, question people don't accept the, uh, just because someone says that there is a prejudice, that there is a prejudice. Show them what is going on in the media. Point out to them that women have led these high profile cases and they are doing very well. Indeed, yes, that, that's really inspiring and uh, we should have that notion with us. So, I'm going to have to apologize before I start because uh, I'm not going to answer the question you put to me, but... Um, <laughs> um, we're lawyers and, and we care about semantics. Um, crucially, um, inherent biases, unconscious biases are very much driven by language and how it's used, um, particularly in something like law. So it would be a miss for me uh, as a man sitting in this room, to to just call upon everybody to be cautious when they're using language. Um, women are women, so when they're 18 and above, they're women. They're not girls. And I think uh, the references to you know lawyers being girls is is not appropriate. Mm -hmm. I think I think that's something that we have to we have to be cautious about. I say that because. Even in practice, um, sometimes we see judges. Um, you know, I would walk into a courtroom with a with Ms. Nau, for instance, who's more qualified than me, still sometimes get referred to as an Anghunkut, meaning a girl. But they're women. They are you know, more qualified than us. So I think, I think those inherent biases are sometimes very importantly driven in language and how it's used. So we have to take our responsibility and make sure that we use appropriate language when we go to them. Thank you. Indeed, that, that's going to help. So uh, we should you know, rephrase our vocabulary and we have to. Indeed, that's, that's a quite valid point. That, that these things are wired uh, to our brains and indeed the way we speak it portrays what we think. So the, with the speech, it will there will be a reverse reaction and the things inside the heart will change. It was mentioned that we should move away from this current model of working and studying together. But I think what we need to acknowledge is uh, that it's a matter of privilege because students who are studying and working are doing so because they don't have any other choice. And uh, I was lucky enough to go abroad and just focus on my studies. But uh, those law students who are studying in Maldives, I think they are doing double work and I think we should appreciate them and acknowledge them for it rather and uh, for the conversation of moving away from it I think we need to find different solutions for it rather than uh, focusing it on the students and just uh, yeah what, what I wanted to say is it's not the fault of the students and we need to acknowledge the situation Indeed, indeed. Uh, maybe there was a bit uh, communication thing because we, we uh, the students quoted two points. One, those who actually have financial difficulties, it's acknowledged, it has to be acknowledged that they're balancing the both. And the other students, 
just because of peer pressure, because they want to have their own earned money in their pocket. Like everybody is doing job, we should also do some job. And our parents are, uh, parents are filling your pockets, but still you want job because everybody is doing it. So indeed, if it's a necessity that, that can, nothing can be that, that's the best when you're uh, out of necessity, you're doing that. But when sometimes it's out of peer pressure, so that is something that we can say that, hey, come on, wait for two more years, let's study first, you have enough, and then uh, we can go for earning. So, uh, yes, uh, our dean wants to uh, say something. Yeah, I actually want you to appreciate what you actually said, like I already mentioned it. It is actually kind of, I think, something we don't appreciate enough, the fact that we do have a lot of students who are actually currently studying full-time, at the same time also doing a full-time job. And I think there are few people, especially women like us, who have had the opportunity to go abroad and you know, who are able to have the opportunity of being full-time students. And currently we also have to appreciate the fact that by having you know, access for students to have education, whether it is as students who are full-time you know, workers, is still an access to education which they would not possibly have if otherwise. Okay, so I would say instead of actually discouraging students or potential students to work, I think if they actually aim in a way that they could actually balance both work as well as you know study, they could actually strategize their work in a way that they could actually boost their career when they actually finish work. And as well, I think a lot of students that I have met who are actually graduating do have shared their concerns regarding opportunities for internship which could accommodate their current situations. For example, students who are within islands or students who are young mothers who would have difficulty coming into, let's say for example, you know, internship opportunities. I think this is where we need to actually discuss within the legal fraternity and try to bridge this gap where we can actually incorporate access to education and also access to you know a legal fraternity so i think instead of discouraging students to come to law school as you know working students or as you know students who are studying part-time i think we need to find solutions within the fraternity where we can accommodate for these students where they can do jobs part time, where they can, you know, do remote working. So I think this is where we need to actually divert our conversations. Indeed. So I guess the same will be communicated to the community. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a very point. Uh, uh, yes. Um, I'm very for chambers again. Mm -hmm. uh, to one of, I would like to uh, one of the issues I think that was mentioned, but from a different perspective, there was uh, a question or there was a concern that students uh, studying from abroad, from universities abroad, or uh, as opposed to students studying in Moldovan universities. Uh, just a point, uh, this is something I believe that is that exists. There is a discrimination. There is a discriminatory attitude. Uh, there has been uh, for a long time and I hope it's getting better but only you can tell us otherwise uh, that attitude is that students who study in the Maldives are not as well taught, well educated, well qualified as those who study from abroad, from universities abroad and that is reprehensible, that is unacceptable but unfortunately that is uh, what a lot, that is the attitude a lot of uh, employees have so we need to do more to address that, we need to do more to to call it out. We need to do more to rectify that so that none of those who are studying in college or colleges in the Maldives, none of them face that same material. There are so many who have already faced that and who have who have had that thrown at them, and and despite all of that, they have persevered. But that doesn't mean it, uh, and, and that absolutely means it should not continue. So there needs to be more, and I think law schools can do uh, a lot more in that, uh, in that regard. And I believe the bar council also can do a lot more in that regard. There is one other uh, aspect. I, this is a question 
to the law students, is your faculty, are your law schools doing enough? You mentioned you were working while studying. So does your law school actually accommodate that? Or does it do, um, is it neutral or does it not even consider that at all? Do you get enough time to balance your job and your st studies requirements in terms of, for example, coursework? When you are given uh, work to complete, does your law school accommodate the fact or, or consider the fact that you have to report for work, let's say, from 8 to 5 and then you are going to class? After which, um, maybe your classes end at 8, 9, 10 in the evening. And yet, they are assigning you work today that is due tomorrow. Do you find that or do you find that there is an accommodation that is given? Uh, for that, uh, I can't speak on behalf of all the students, but as a working student myself, I do believe that there is a new, neutral line that the, uh, that the college provides with for us. But I think most, mostly it's a sacrifice that has been done on my part of me balancing my work and my coursework myself. So yeah. Uh, why don't you mention uh, the last week when you asked for extension and, and I gave it to you guys. <laughs> and yeah, I can vouch for her personally. First student I've seen in her first year, her paper, I really, I just kissed it. Really, it was that good. And I can share it with you all if you want. Her citation, referencing, so limited legal literature, but she has cited from presidency website, all the government website, she has translated the Devehi documents available into English, she has referred to the paragraphs of the judgments, she has referred to uh, international jurisdictions, and she's in her first year, and it's her first submission like that. And I guarantee like it can be published with one reading in an international journal. And I have oh, I have undertook this responsibility that I'm going to give you that thing and you have your first publication, inshallah. So you can clap for yourself. Come on. Uh, so well, uh, that, that it was really quite interactive and wonderful feedbacks from, uh, from everybody and especially for, for, from the students. Uh, they're sitting in the back. Thank you. Wonderful points. Uh, so yes, and with this, uh, this like a uh, huge round of applause you received, right? So it's something that you uh, should build up your confidence and be like this. You're, you're going to do much better, right? Yes. You're going to leave everybody behind. Uh, you are the face now. <laughs> so indeed. Uh, so with this, uh, we we will be concluding this uh, casual informal student podcast and I will be handing it over to our Master of Ceremony, Ms. Shima.